worship our Lord. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God. And we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. Oh God, the people of your pasture. sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgression to the Lord. Here's the first part. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Let's sing. Really? 
grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from a raging sea and I am safe on the solid ground the Lord is my salvation I will not fear darkness falls. His strength will help me scale these walls. I'll see the dawn of the rising sun. The Lord is my salvation. salvation 
Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 10. Lord, why do you stand so far away? Why do you hide in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked relentlessly pursue their victims. Let them be caught in the schemes they have devised. <clears throat> For the wicked one boasts about his own cravings. The one who is greedy curses and despises the Lord. In all his scheming, the wicked person arrogantly thinks there is no accountability since there is no God. His ways are always secure. Your lofty judgments have no effect on him. He scoffs at all his adversaries. He says to himself, I will never be moved from generation to generation without calamity. Cursing, deceit, and violence fill his mouth. Trouble and malice are under his tongue. He waits in ambush near settlements. He kills the innocent in secret places. His eyes are on the lookout for the helpless. He lurks in secret like a lion in a thicket. He lurks in order to seize a victim. He seizes a victim and drags him in his net. So he is oppressed and beaten down. Helpless people fall because of the wicked one's strength. He says to himself, God has forgotten. He hides his face and will never see. Rise up, Lord God. Lift your hand. Do not forget the oppressed. Why has the wicked person despised God? He says to himself, you will not demand an account. But you yourself have seen trouble and grief, observing it in order to take the matter into your hands. The helpless one entrusts himself to you. You are a helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked, evil person until you look for his wickedness, but it can't be found. 
The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their hearts. You will listen carefully, doing justice for the fatherless and the oppressed, so that mere humans from the earth may terrify them no more. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day daily bread. Feed us, Father, from your throne today. May we hear from you. May we be changed by the sound of your voice. And Father, no doubt, Unless you do it, we stand here in vain. Father, there is so much around us that we see. So much pain and heartache. Father, the so many victims... of sex trafficking, even in our own region, in our own area, kids getting traded for rent. Children sold, living a life of slavery, raped, abused, neglected, And God, we see this, and we throw our hands up, and we don't know what to do. Father, we cross a bridge in a little while, and underneath that bridge, there's people living without a place to hang their head. Father, there's children and grandchildren of folks who have been absolutely consumed with the awful evil of drug addiction. And their children are neglected. Their children are passed around like a second-hand piece of furniture. And so, for those who are being trafficked, for those who have no home, for those who are neglected, we bring them before you, the great God of heaven. And we ask you to move. Move in this congregation and in the congregations all around us to help. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. For your glory, we pray. Amen. The Bible is real. Now, I don't mean that as like an argument to some quack that says the Bible isn't true. He's just wrong. But I say that the Bible is real in a sense that it speaks of and to the hard things of your life. Real life. God speaks through his word. 
into the dark places of your life. How does the Bible do that? How does a book thousands of years old written in three dead languages make its way from crispy white pages at your dining room table into the dirty muck of your life? And how do those words actually make a difference in your life? Well, friend, it's a supernatural work of God. It's divine. No human can do that. No man can make the book live in your heart and in your life. You see, inside this book, there are many different types of writings. Now, there's some biographies, there's some poetry, there's some future predictions, there are letters and there are songs. And in each different type of writing inside this book, especially the songs where we are camped out for the summer, we find lament. What is lament? One writer puts it, to lament is to express deep sorrow, to express deep grief, to express deep regret. When you look back over your life, you remember the high points, don't you? Children are born. Marriages happen. Homes are purchased. Good things. Vacations. Um, good memories. Heather and I are all the time talking about, didn't, which one of the kids did this? Which one of the kids said this? Which one of the kids done this? And you look back over your life and you think of the high points. But beloved, if if we're being honest, when we look back over our life, we also remember the low points, don't we? What are the low points of life? Sorrow, grief, and regret. Show me someone who does not or has not experienced sorrow, grief, or regret, and I'll either show you a child or someone who has not lived outside of a bubble. So what are the people of God to do with their sorrows, their griefs, and their regrets? Are we supposed to just bottle them up? Bottle them up, take them around with us, and then guess what? Someone's going to get close enough to us, and then we're going to explode. You know people like that? Is that what we're supposed to do as the people of God? Are we supposed to drag them around? Brother Tom's not here, but he always says, I'm looking forward to the day when I get to heaven and I don't have to drag the old dead man around with me anymore. Are we supposed to drag the, the sorrows, the griefs, and the regrets around with us everywhere we go, making us sick, not only us sick, but us toxic to the people around us? No, God has not left us in our sorrows, our griefs, or regrets. Friend, God is a friend of sinners. He has not left us to ourselves. He helps us. Why does he help us? Because he cares for us. He heals us. And one of the ways that he does it is by using the songs of lament. The songs that express pain, sorrow, regret, grief. Listen to what Luther said. What is the greatest thing in the Psalter? But this earnest speaking amid the storm winds of every kind. Ah, we run to the Psalms. And, and there in the Psalms we read, uh, My God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Oh, Jesus ran to the Psalms as well. 
There on the cross, the songbook of God's people came out of Jesus' mouth. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 10 can be classified as a song of lament. It was written by David. And it almost seems like if we step back from Psalm 9 just a little bit, Randy, instead of like being, or Psalm 10 being right in it, but if we step back from Psalm 10 and we look at Psalm 9 and 10 together, which some folks want to do, it's almost like we get a picture you know when you go to Kings Island or Bush Gardens or wherever you go and you get on the roller coaster and they take that picture? They don't take the picture coming up the hill, do they? They always take the picture coming down the hill. When your face looks like it's getting ready to fall off. Here, Psalm 9 gives the picture of coming up the hill and Psalm 10 is the action shot as it comes back down look with me in verse 9 or chapter 9 we'll just run through it real quick I will thank the Lord with all my heart I'll declare all your wondrous works I'll rejoice and boast about you I'll sing about your name he says verse 3 my enemies retreat make them stumble Verse 7, the Lord sits enthroned forever. He's established his throne for judgment. He judges the world with righteousness. Verse 11, sing to the Lord. Verse 13, be gracious to me, Lord. Verse 14, so I may declare all your praises. Verse 15, the nations have fallen. Verse 16, the Lord has made himself known. Verse 19, rise up, Lord. Verse 20, put terror in them, Lord. This is the song of justice. God will deliver his people. And we think, man, David's on a roll. He's never coming down from the mountain. Chapter 10, verse 1, Lord. Why do you stand so far away from me? Why do you hide in times of trouble? What is going on? David is having a crisis of faith. You ever had one? Here's what he's asking. Where are you? You're supposed to be here. It's almost scandalous, isn't it? That he, David, is talking to God this way. If this was one of us at the graveside of a loved one, we may be tempted to say, as this woman goes to the graveside of her child and she says these things, she says, why do you stand so far away from me, God? Why do you hide from me in this time of trouble? What would we say to her? You shouldn't talk like that. It's foolishness. God is sovereign. I guess she just doesn't have the faith. You know, she's, she just never did read her Bible the right way. She could never get latched on to the reading plan. I guess she just doesn't have the faith that, that some of us have. I guess she's never read Calvin's Institutes. Uh, she never heard that, 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 that line that, that from R.C. Sproul that there's not one rogue molecule in the world. Someone get that woman a Puritan paperback. Somebody get her on grace to you and let her hear some John MacArthur. She'll learn. And beloved, that's all wrong. You see, God has ordained prayer 
honest prayer, real, raw, unpolished, crying out to God prayer. And that's exactly what David is doing. David is actually praying. Dr. O. Halsby said, prayer has been ordained only for the helpless. I have people all the time tell me, you know what? I really struggle with prayer. My answer from here on is this. You're not helpless enough. Only he who is helpless can pray. What's been the, the times of prayer in your life? What has been the times of sweetest communion with God in your life? When you feel closest to him, as far as prayer is concerned, it's when the bottom drops out. David here says, where are you? And then he says, don't you see what they're doing? Look with me in verse 2. In arrogance, the wicked, we're introduced to another person here. It's not just David, but there's a, a wicked person here. In arrogance, the wicked relentlessly pursue their victims. So actually, we have three different groups. We have David praying. We have the wicked oppressor. And then we have, we have victims what he says let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised don't you see what they're they're doing are you around can you hear can you see are you hiding from me and we're introduced to the wicked oppressor now verses 3 through 11 describe this wicked oppressor now, we don't know who this person is. It could be a person in David's life. It could be that David, as the king, is seeing down as the people of God are moving around and living their lives. And he sees someone manhandling and manipulating people. Or it could be a group of people that is hurting another group of people. And David loves the victims. Maybe it's another king that is trying to oppress David. Or maybe it's even another nation trying to oppress the children of God. But what we do know is this, that there is an oppressor and there are victims. And here is what the oppressor is doing. Look with me quickly in verse 3. For the wicked one boasts about his own cravings. The one who is greedy curses and despises the Lord. This, this oppressor, this wicked person, he is arrogant and he is boasting about his own cravings. He's satisfying his own cravings. And how is he doing it? On the backs of, of, of victims. And he curses and he despises God. What else is this oppressor doing? Look with me in verse 5. His ways are always secure. Your lofty judgments have no effect on him. This is his thinking. This is what it looks like from the outside. He's prospering well. Look in verse 7. Cursing, deceit, and violence fill his mouth. Trouble and malice are under his tongue. Bible students, you'll remember that Romans tells us about this person too, doesn't it? He's cursing, he's lying, he's full of violence and trouble and malice. It's, it's coming out of his mouth, it's in his conversations. Look at verse 8. He waits in ambush near settlements or cities. He gets close to people where people are vulnerable and there he preys upon people. He kills the innocent in secret places. The innocent are being killed at this person's hands. Verse 9, well, verse 8, his eyes are on the lookout for the helpless. He lurks in secret like a lion, lion in a thicket. He lurks in order to seize a victim. He seizes a victim and drags him in his net. This is what the wicked oppressor is doing. He's abusing people. 
innocent people. And those innocent people are victims. But here's what the oppressor is like. Let's look at two sets of verses together. Look at four and six with me. In all his scheming, the wicked person arrogantly thinks, circle that word in your Bible, thinks, there's no accountability since there's no God. Here's what he's thinking. I can do whatever I want because there's no God. Verse 6. He says to himself, I'll never be moved. From generation to generation, I will be without calamity. All my life and my kids, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prey upon these innocent people and I'm going to build up my wealth and my, my life is really about my wealth. wealth. I'll never see hard times. Why? Because I'm a self-made man. And God has nothing to do with it because there is no God. Kidner says he is a practicing atheist. And let me tell you something about practicing atheists. All practicing atheists are practicing liars. There's no atheists. There's just men who want to do what they want to do and doesn't, they don't want a God. Look with me in verse 11. We'll look at verse 11 and 13 together to get a better picture of this walking contradiction. Verse 11, he says to himself, God has forgotten. He hides his face and will never see. You dummy. You just said there wasn't no God. And now what's he say? Oh, he'll never see. Do you see what's going on? He's a walking contradiction. He says there's no God, but in deep down in his heart, he says, ah, he'll never see. Look at verse 13, the second half of it. He says to himself, you will not demand an account. There'll be no judgment, he says. Well, why are you worried about judgment? You don't even believe in God. Everybody believes in God. This is the wicked oppressor. I, I've been reluctant to tell you to do this in your Bible, but I'm going to do it anyway. The first point was David's crisis of faith. The second point was this wicked oppressor. But right there between verses 11 and 12, I'd like to make a note. Another point. I'm not adding to the Bible, but I want us to pause and reflect here between verses 11 and 12 because something happens. You know, up to this point, we could say that David and the oppressor and the practicing atheist, the same guy, oppressor, practicing atheist, the wicked man who is hurting innocent people, David and him are very different. Would you agree with me? Say amen if you agree with me. But we could also say they're very similar. You say, Chris, David's not oppressing anybody. David ain't, ain't out here like a lion trying to catch people and bring them in. David's the man after God's own heart. Look with me in verse 1. David says, why do you stand so far away? Why do you hide in times of trouble? Look with me in verse 11. This wicked man says, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He'll never see. You see... What's the similarity, you would say? They're both under the impression that God is distant. But there is a, a difference in these two men. You see, David is praying, and the other man isn't. I don't know if you got that or not. David is praying. And the other man's just thinking. Del Ralph Davis says it like this. He doesn't understand Yahweh. David. David doesn't understand the Lord. But he's still dealing with Yahweh. 
And that is being faithful. He doesn't understand. But he's still praying. And David has what the wicked oppressor obviously doesn't have. So what I want you to do, in, right there in your Bible, between verses 11 and 12, put this reference down there for me. Mark this in your Bible. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Right there between those two verses. 1 Samuel 16, 13. And let me read it to you. I'll read the last half of verse 12. Then the Lord said, anoint him, for he is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, that's David, in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David from that day forward. What's the difference in these two men? The spirit of the living God. David has the very spirit of God. And when a child of God prays, no matter how raw, no matter how elementary or how unpolished it sounds, the spirit of God is at work as well. Now I can prove it. Now I'm not preaching every week right now, so I'm getting to think a lot. What's the difference in David? The Spirit of God. What's the difference in you and the person you go to work with? The Spirit of God. You say, Chris, I don't, I ain't very good at praying. I, I, I struggled with prayer. Oh man, do I got a verse for you. Romans 8, mark this in the margin of your Bible. No, just turn there with me. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. I'll let you get there. What does David have? David has the very Spirit of God. David has the very God that he was praying to on him. In him. And when a child of God prays, the Spirit of God is at work. Romans 8 26. Are you ready? In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. Was there ever a time of weakness like we see in Psalm 10? Where are you? Have you hid your face? In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should. David does not know what to pray for. David just says, have you hid your face? Are you, are you hiding from me? Do you not care about me anymore? And then he just starts rambling on about the wicked oppressor. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness because we don't know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. And he who searches our hearts, that's God the Father, knows the mind of the Spirit, the Spirit that's groaning on your behalf according to the will of God. Listen to what Swindoll said. Not only does the Spirit convict us of sin and teach us truth, He endures our suffering with us. He has been called alongside to help us endure. Check this. When I'm tempted to think that God is cruel to leave us in our suffering, I remember that He, too, moans with groanings too deep for words. When I see a mother sobbing over the dead body of her child, I know the Holy Spirit suffers her anguish too. When I see a man kiss the cold cheek of his bride and give her body to the care of a mortician, I know the Holy Spirit feels his desperate ache. 
He is the spirit of the creator who made these bodies to reflect his glory, not suffer disease, disaster, death, and decay. He loves us even more than we love ourselves. And therefore, he groans with us. Fortunately, the Holy Spirit possesses power that we do not. At the end of our strength, we groan, and that's it. At the end of our strength, we groan. Have you ever prayed to the point that you have nothing to say? I've grown to the point where it's just stopped. There's nothing more, Swindoll writes. The Spirit groans, though, with a purpose. He intercedes on our behalf, praying with wisdom that we don't possess, requesting for us what we are too short-sighted to perceive. And... Most important of all, he groans his intercessions in heaven so that our minds and the mind of the Father will unite to accomplish his will. There's something happening between verse 11 and 12. There's a turn. David's head lifts and his prayer all of a sudden changes, and that is exactly what prayer does. It changes us. As Swindoll said, our minds and the mind of the Father is united. And now, by the Spirit of God, united with the Father, David moves. In two ways. One, he's reminded of God's attributes. Rise up, Lord God, verse 12 says. Lift up your hand. Don't forget the oppressed. Why does the wicked person despise God? He says to himself, you'll not demand an account, but, but you yourself have seen trouble and grief, observing it in order to take the matter into your hands. Do you know what he is saying? He's saying, Lord God, you are omnipresent. Omnipresence is the attribute of God that is best described as he is in every place and in every time simultaneously. Frame said it like this. He is here with us, really here with us. He is not absent. That's exactly what he's saying here. You've seen that trouble. You're not hiding your face. You've seen it. You've seen the grief. You've seen what this oppressor is doing. And you're observing it so that you are going to take it into your own hands. Not only is he omnipresent, but David is reminded by the Spirit of God that he is omnibenevolent. Now, we've got to have an honest conversation. A sovereign God without a loving God, you don't want. Now, this church has majored on the sovereignty of God in all things to the point that you're preaching to the choir. But, beloved, hear me today. This sovereign God is omnibenevolent. What does that mean, Chris? Omnibenevolent. It's the quality of being completely good. He's perfect in all of his ways. He's a good, good father. He's omnipresent, David says. He's, you, you, you see, he's, he's climbing back up that mountain again. Ain't nobody taking no pictures. But he's climbing up that mountain. The wheels start turning. The spirit starts moving. What is he? He's, he's omnipresent. He hasn't left me alone. He's everywhere. Not only that, but he's omnibenevolent. He's good. He cares. He, he's Every good thing is measured next to him. Anything good, anything lovely, anything beautiful 
is measured against him because he's all good, all lovely, all beautiful, omnibenevolent. Look what he says there. The helpless one entrusts himself to you. You're a helper of the fatherless. You're a daddy to those who don't have a daddy. But not only that, not only is he everywhere and not only is he always good in every way, but there's one other thing that David remembers. This God, he's omnipotent. Look at what verse 15 says. Break the arm of the wicked, evil person. What does that mean? Snap his arm off. There's only one who can stop the wicked. There's only one who can stop evil. Break the arm simply means stopping. Break the arm of the wicked, evil person. This isn't even a request it's more like a prophecy. Break the arm of the wicked evil person until you look for his wickedness and it cannot be found. Snuff him completely out. What kind of creature could do this? No kind of creature can do this. Only an all-powerful God can do this. Now moved by the Spirit to remember that God, the God he is speaking to and the God that he is in covenant with David does not forget his problems. We often think that, that, that the way to get through things is, is simply to, to forget them. Just get on to happier things. Get on to brighter things. Get your mind on something else. We lost the children, and I, and I remember wrestling with the idea of what in the, how in the world am I ever going to survive this? This week, it seems like it's really been heavy on me. This week, again, and it's just so many things that weren't dealt with in my heart. Just trying to look for something brighter to set my focus on. There's no contentment in those things. No, beloved. The child of God in the muck of life, doesn't have to forget there are real problems. He doesn't gloss over the oppressor and his evil actions. He doesn't have to ignore them. No, instead, David, by the Spirit of God, focuses, his, his focus shifts to something better. It shifts to Jesus. A thousand years before Jesus walked the dusty streets of Galilee. David, in his prayer closet, turns his eyes to Jesus. And do you know what David says, essentially? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. That song's for you, Christian. The way of the world, gloss over your problems, forget it. Put your mind on happier things. Put you on some, some, uh, some good music. Get some comfort food. Look around us. We've made enough comfort food to sink the battleship. Can I get an amen? And it ain't helped a nary one of us, has it? But the way of God's people is to follow Jesus through the suffering to the glory that lay before him. Look with me now in verses 16 through 18. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his land. Lord, you've heard the desire of the humble. You you will strengthen their hearts. You will listen carefully. You're going to do justice for the fatherless and the oppressed so that mere human beings from the earth will terrify them no more. When's that coming? When Jesus comes. You see, beloved, 
in light of redemption. Redemption is God saving his people. Now David sees his life and what is going on around him with spiritual eyes. And he sees that God is making all things right. That a Savior will come. And when you come up here in just a minute and you partake of this table, that's what you're saying. I believe that a Savior came and that he crushed the head of the serpent with his own body and blood. And I believe that that same Savior is returning to banish all evil. You proclaim his death until he comes. This was David's hope. Notice what he says there. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his land. What's his land? Everything. There will be a time when there's no more evil. There will be a time when there's no more injustice. There will be a time when people are not oppressed any longer. There will be a time when you don't suffer from depression. There'll be a time when you don't suffer from anxiety. There'll be a time when you don't suffer from health issues or neglect. There'll be a time when you don't have to drag those things around. There's coming a day when Jesus comes back. Set your mind and your eyes upon him. And to your future redemption. This is what the people of God do. Three points of application. Number one, fall apart, but keep praying. Your life's falling apart. Your health's falling apart. Your finances are in the garbage. People are, are, are around you saying hurtful things about you. You're uneasy. You, you have cancer in your body. Don't stop praying. And you've got to be real. Like these prayers. Of like, Thou help. Be real. Have you hid your face from me? Are you still here? Give me an honest, raw prayer to a strong and loving God any day over a cold statement about God from a man that gets secondhand information from a YouTube video. Life is hard. Will we just quit ignoring it? And pray. Number two, preachers, this is what we need. We need honesty, we need lament. We need real Spirit of God infused preaching and praying. It does no good to know Calvin but to not know Christ. These people in this congregation, preachers, they don't need your quippy quotes. They need you to give them Jesus because their lives are falling apart. And if He isn't your hope, this future redemption... That he's coming back and making all things new. If that is not your hope, don't get in the pulpit. When their kids get taken away, when their homes are turned upside down because they've got a foster kid in it, when they're losing their health and losing their mind, when the load of regret of their sins is almost too heavy to pack around, just be real with them. Lament with God's people. And he has given us lament to point them to God who is making all things right. And yes, God is sovereign. But beloved, God is good. Last point of application. Be the church. Honest, lamenting, looking for redemption.
do you know what the other church members here need out of you, church member? Honesty. We it's good, isn't it? We do not need to hide our pain, grief, or regret from God. And we don't need to hide it from each other. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you, Lord, are king forever and ever. The nations will perish from this land. So God, we ask you to hear our desires, strengthen our hearts, listen carefully to us, looking forward to the day when ultimately you do justice for the fatherless and the oppressed. Until that time, may we do justice for the fatherless and the oppressed. So that mere humans from the earth will terrify them no more. It's in the name of Jesus we pray.